Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming uh, in such great numbers to our program tonight. Uh, we'll start our program by uh, inviting our HR department representative to say a few words, and then we'll, uh, we'll continue with the program. So Grace, if you wanna. Welcome everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so welcome to the Digital Factory. We are super excited to be hosting this AI meetup with you guys tonight. Um, I'm Grace Chua, I'm a senior recruitment consultant here for Digital Factory, as well as the Greater Digital Banking Organization. And um, you may have heard some rumblings about how Scotia has been going on a major digital transformation over the last couple of years. And um, you know, it's been an incredible journey. You know, we're we have this beautiful space here tonight, where um, you know we're we're really trying to build some transformative, transformational customer experiences um, digitally for 23 million customers globally that we have. And a big part of my role has been to really recruit for the analytics group here. And I've hired about 35 data scientists over the last 10 months alone for our core AI and machine learning group for here within the digital factory for our enterprise applied analytics team. This team, I'm telling you, has been doing some amazing stuff with fraud detection, um, with recommender systems, building chatbots, a deep social profiler using Twitter API data. Um, so if you guys, and that's just the beginning. So if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about what we're doing here, feel free to come up to me. I'll be here all night so we can grab a drink, we can chat, and uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you guys. Thanks. So as you can see, life is not fair. When I started talking, nobody started applauding, but when Grace started talking, <laughs> anybody started. So, yeah. So, um, first about the AI gigs. Um, recently, in the last few years, as you noticed, everywhere you go, you hear about AI. And just to prove my point, I uh, took the news from the last two days. So I have an alert for Google, which sends me an email each time there is uh, something about AI in Toronto. And there are, see how many, four pages of news. And uh, let me read some of them to you. Elevate Health, uh, Health says AI can dramatically improve patient care. Artificial Intelligence Symposium, Symposium in Montreal. AI startup uh, Deep Genomics lends financing in its aim to flip medicine on the back. And the financing is actually a 30 mil, uh, $13 million. Carnegie Mellon professor named CEO of Canadian uh, Vector Institute. Rise of the robots from big data to artificial intelligence. And another few, uh, these were from last week or so. Google launches Google Brain Toronto. Peter Musk donates $100 million for the cardiac center. They will work on a device that will use AI to monitor the heart of the patients that will allow the patients to stay more at home than uh, in the hospital. Amazon headquarters, maybe in Montreal or Toronto. And uh, AI can detect Alzheimer's disease 10 years before the symptom appear. So these are the news that just in the last few days, uh, few days uh, appear in the media. So the development of AI uh, in the world, but for us, uh, especially in uh, Toronto, it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, lots of companies are starting uh, to go into AI. Uh, that's a lot of money to be made there. And maybe also some of you are dreaming that uh, maybe to have a company and uh, to start working with AI. But uh, not all of us can do that. So we have uh, maybe families, maybe have other jobs. For example, I am an iPhone developer, so I'm not working in AI. But still, uh, AI became so accessible to, to everybody. There are tools that just with maybe one or two weeks of uh, courses or reading a book, you can, uh, you can apply them. Uh, that's why we, <coughs> we started first the Meetup, and now we registered it as a non-for-profit organization, hoping that maybe with you, uh, we can uh, make some groups to create uh, 
small projects we can work maybe in the evenings or in the weekends trying to solve some uh, problems the world is facing so if you are interested uh, you can join or you can work by yourself uh, on some projects and maybe we can uh, advertise it together and uh, maybe try to improve uh, the world as we know it. Okay. I want to show you a movie. Uh, I don't know if anybody came last time. You'll have a chance to see to see the same movie again. But it's a, a beautiful movie, and uh, it's kind of what we hope to to achieve with this uh, AI gigs. So I'll play the video now. Come on, Cookie. I don't know how you're supposed to feel at 86, but I don't think I feel like I'm 86. Surprise! <laughs> People make my world go round. I fear isolation and being cut off. If I am alone somewhere and I have no one to talk to, no one to share anything with, I bet you I, I would just dry up and blow away. I, I call this my smart house. We got sensors in all the rooms. I swallow them. I wear them. <laughs> Doc knows what's going on with me. I don't have to go to the clinic anymore. I just, I call him up. He's not back in the horse and buggy days. Looks like you had a pretty active week, huh? I'm feeling it too. Hey guys, how, how do you like your room? Knowing I got eyes on me gives me the confidence to keep me being who I am. Doing what I want to do <laughs> frees me up. It was a story, Takes the worry away. I don't have to worry about Paige, my daughter. Hey, hey kiddo, what's up? I'm just checking in. Because I know she's not worried about me. No, no, I'm she's kidding. always busy, work and kids. But she can see exactly how I'm doing. I love you, Dad. That, that she knows how I feel before I do. <laughs> Cookie has become my buddy. Time for your pill, Jim. My wingman. Hey, hey, Cookie, what time is that car gonna be here? Two minutes. It's cold out. Might wanna bring a coat. It's, it's like he has a brain. Now, what, what are you doing, Cookie? It's a quick... I have come to rely on him. I know I can trust him, and he's got my back. I lost Ellen, my wife, 10 years ago. So many good times, so many memories. Losing her was really tough. If we had had for her then, what we have for me now, she would have been in a much better place. I, I miss her so much. Here, not too long ago, I was, I was experiencing those uh, dizzy spells. The, the doctor had, had provided a scan for me at, at home, so I didn't have to go out to the clinic or anything. They have those scans for that patient. Take a look. And that scan revealed that I had an aneurysm. I saw this specialist, a surgeon, and she explained to me, we wouldn't have a messy operation. They inject these nanobots and they go into your system. Basically, we're going to send in an army of nanobots at the aneurysm. And they, they find where that aneurysm is and they... Fixing it. They seal it off. I, I get a kick out of thinking that I have a whole bunch of nanobots swimming around up here in my brain, <laughs> doing what they're supposed to do. I wasn't in the hospital. I was back home. I was back home where I want to be, where I belong. The help that I have allows me to stay here in my home. Who is that? Do you remember? The guy in the back. Who is that? I have my friends here. That's Pete. My family. And I don't want to give that up. I don't want to be in a nursing home. The, the quickest way to lose your independence is to go where you don't have any independence. <laughs> That's the truth.
Yes, so how awesome would it be if we could work on one of the product that uh, can improve somebody's life in that way? So now back to our schedule for the day. We, have, uh, we are happy today to have two speakers. The first one will be talking about, uh, to us about learning uh, uh, from raw data with uh, DNN. And the second one, the future of AI in financial institution. And considering that we are in a bank, that's uh, really appropriate. Then we'll present you next meeting's details. Then we have some prices. And that's about it. So I would like to invite uh, Julian to get the mic. Oh, he already has the mic. Hello everyone, can everyone hear me at the back? All right, uh, so uh, I, I guess I can start with just a little bit about me. I, uh, I was interested in neural networks uh, since when I was in university. I first basically started experimenting with uh, convolutional neural networks uh, and uh, I was incredibly impressed that even the mistakes it was making, it was mistakes that I, I could have made. Uh, but back then, that was not very popular now. It's only in the last like 10 years that it's been picking up. So I briefly went into uh, like aerospace with flight simulators. Uh, then we started a startup trying to extract data from receipts and provide receipt solution. Uh, and I'm currently working with Sensibil, uh, building receipt products with uh, deep neural networks. Uh, so first, uh, first I would like to talk a little bit about the principles behind deep learning, uh, which is more than basically stacking a bunch of layers together. Um, the, the, the main principle with deep learning is that we'll, we'll learn from raw data. Uh, so instead of using uh, uh, pre-processing techniques, trying to change the data into bringing it into familiar forms. Uh, the idea with deep learning is that we don't want to design these handcrafted features that we have to basically redesign uh, every time we switch domains. So we, we have different features, extractors for sound, different ones from images, and uh, whatever new problems come, uh, most of the research that's done is in trying to do these feature extractions and then feed it to one of the existing uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, techniques. Uh, so the idea here is that we don't want to do this pre-processing, we just want to feed the raw data as is, possibly, and let the machine figure out what are the most important things and what are the regularities in the data that needs to be extracted. Uh, and uh, also use general purpose architectures. Uh, so eventually where this deep learning field is going is in, is in building, uh, is building a, a true artificial intelligence, general intelligence. So that's why a lot of research is going into algorithms that are not specific to the data types that we're trying to process, uh, but work in general. So the same algorithm could work for images, could work for text, could work for sound. Uh, we just need to basically do a preliminary pre-process to just transform the data into, into numbers, because that's what the neural nets, just no numbers. And then uh, we would just use the same neural net for uh, analyzing sound and analyzing images. Uh, and the way we, we achieve that with deep learning is we use this multi-layer approach. So uh, at the beginning you have the raw data that uh, feeds into the input layer. And then the input layer uh, learns how to extract some uh, higher level features from that. And then we can repeat the process by adding more layers to extract higher and higher, uh, higher and higher level of information so that at the end it can basically get uh, classified or, or whatever the task it is that you want to make out of that. Uh, so just to get a, basically an idea of the whole uh, evolution of this field, I wanted to include a little bit of history because uh, uh, 
uh, especially because uh, only the, the like the recent 10 years are known about this deep learning field and it seems like it came out of nowhere, but actually there's been decades of research that uh, only currently crystallized into a proper field and uh, all the companies picked them up and now it's this, this new craze of deep learning. So, <coughs> sorry. Uh, we can consider the father of deep learning, uh, Ivan Henko, uh, which is a, a Ukrainian, I believe, uh, scientist. Since 1965, he started experimenting with this multi-layer idea. Uh, now, back then, he didn't have this back propagation that we use now to train our, our models. He had this similar looking to neurons, units, and he would use this regression analysis uh, to train each layer at a time. And then he would have a, another technique to basically reduce the number of parameters to figure out what are the parameters that are not really doing too much work and kind of keep pruning these layers. And eventually if the one layer was not good enough, he would add another layer on top, repeat the process until he would get the good accuracy that he wanted. So, uh, and he, he actually, his, neuro, his nets were, were not technically neural networks, but his, his networks were used up until the new century, uh, and they went up to eight layers since, uh, since back then. Uh, so, uh, a bit later on, um, first, uh, the backpropagation algorithm that now it's used to train all kinds of uh, neural networks, they're all trained with backpropagation. Uh, and then they, they basically, they came out of control theory. So first, Bryson and Kelly, they, they were using uh, continuous signals. So uh, the idea is that uh, you take the output of your network, of whatever the machine is, then you also have uh, what, the, what you want the machine to produce for that current input. And then you make some difference, you, you create this error measure between the actual output and the ideal output that you wanted to produce. Uh, and then the backpropagation algorithm is the way to figure out how to change your parameters so that next time your output to the network will be closer to the desired output. So they first started applying it into control theory in the continuous case. Uh, then there was a, a later research, Lina Inma, who started uh, do, uh, coming up with a back propagation in the continuous space. Uh, and then eventually the first one to apply back propagation uh, to neural networks was uh, Werbus, Paul Werbus in 1974, uh, where he basically is, was using the modern technique of back propagation that we're using today. So we can see that since 1974, we basically had all the components. Uh, we had the, the neuron models, the backpropagation techniques on how to train this idea of the layered process. Uh, and um, so it's been decades that uh, all the main components were there. Uh, uh, and then uh, the, the first, uh, for initially, neural networks were used in this formation of multi-layer perceptron, uh, which is the, the diagram over there. So basically, it, it was it's the same uh, principle that I explained before, that you have layers of neurons. Uh, these are artificial neurons that are basically modeled by the model of the actual neuron. Uh, we have, uh, uh, so we've, we have the input layer and then uh, we would feed that uh, to multiple layers uh, to get to the output layer. And uh, so initially this was sort of the, the, main, uh, the main architecture that was used with neural networks. Uh, but the problem was that uh, you couldn't really add too many layers. It was not really known at the time, but if you kept adding layers, you, you won't get, you didn't get any good results. So therefore, you couldn't really use this as a deep learning uh, network that we're used to now. So people tried with uh, 
um, for example, character or optical recognition or trying to feed basically the raw uh, pixels. So the, in the input layer, if the X is there, it could be just the pixel values directly. And, each, and then you can add layers and then trying to do, say, like an image recognition task, uh, that, that just wouldn't work. So more and more, the research started happening into this feature extractor. So the idea is that you take your raw data, you feed them through uh, some handcrafted, most of the time, algorithm to extract your features, and then you feed your feature vectors to this multi-layer perceptron, uh, and that will basically give you uh, the output that you want, which would be, say, in the case of an image classifier, would be the class of the object. Uh, uh, so. Uh, the problem with this was that um, now the work kind of shifted from the actual neural network to designing these feature extractors. And this didn't really solve the problem because it just moved the complexity uh, to these feature extractors. And that was the reason why neural networks for a long time, I mean since 74 until the 90s, no one was really talking about neural networks. It came to a point where if you had neural networks in your paper, it would just automatically get rejected. Uh, and, and that was, uh, well, there, there was, I, I guess, historical reasons for that. Uh, there was people who basically been working on feature extractors for a long time, and there was other alternatives. Instead of using the multi-layer perceptron, you can use like a support vector machine, or other different techniques that at the time, with the computation power, uh, they were basically getting uh, better or equivalent results. So uh, a lot of researchers basically started to move away from neural networks, uh, despite the initial hype. So there was the first revolution when back propagation came. There was some good theories that came out of that. It was basically shown that if there is a, a set of parameters that can solve the problem, this algorithm is guaranteed to find the, the solution. But the problem was that for real problems, like say an image classification task, the, this set of parameters doesn't exist. So you have to do this feature extractor. Uh, there, there was still a few sort of brave researchers uh, you could probably count them with, with one hand or all around the world, who continue to research in this neural network field. So basically their thinking was, uh, okay, fine, like we can't have just a simple multi-layer perceptron to solve our problems, but we can work with uh, how to extract features with neural networks in an automatic way. So uh, we basically have to find better architectures in, in uh, doing this feature extractor. So uh, one of the other revolutions, which was basically the rebirth of this whole neural network uh, field, uh, was uh, the convolutional neural networks that are now becoming very popular. Uh, that they came from previous research. So the initial model of this convolution neural network was based on biology. Uh, so here comes biology again. First, we, we had our model of the neuron based on our own biological neuron. Uh, now, uh, they started using even architectures that were based on the architecture of our brain. So uh, the, with a project, uh, Lacoon, for example, in, in uh, 1989, uh, he, he showed uh, that uh, his, first of all, he built a data set. So the, the, I guess the drawback of these deep learning techniques is that the da data sets that you need to have, they need to be a lot bigger. Because before, with this feature extraction, we were, uh, we were putting domain knowledge into the problem. So I know, for example, how characters look, so I can handcraft algorithms to design features about how characters look how, and so on, or images and so on. Uh, but with a deep learning approach, there's no domain knowledge being input into the system. So the training set you need is a lot, it needs to be uh, usually a lot bigger. 
So what Lacun did, he first started uh, experimenting with uh, optical character recognition, uh, with handwritten digits. So uh, the printed digits was pretty much uh, already pretty good because printed characters are sort of fit a template. You, you can kind of design handcrafted solutions to try to get that. But uh, handwritten digits are already um, a higher level of complexity. Uh, so what Lacun did, they, they took an existing data set of handwritten characters, uh, which was the NIST, and then he modified it to come up with uh, MNIST, which is now one of the most popular data sets. Uh, it's used as a benchmark for all kinds of algorithms. Uh, so Lacun was, the f uh, was uh, basically the first one to show uh, really good results with convolutional neural networks. Uh, and he could show that there is all these different advantages to using uh, uh, convolutional networks, uh, and then he started to apply that into other domains like sound, uh, different classification tasks, and basically he was able to beat uh, different algorithms that were domain specific, so they were designed specifically for different problems, he was able to beat those benchmark with the same architecture. So that was uh, sort of the first sign that this is really, there's something big behind this. Uh, but even then, they were mainly ignored by the academic community. Uh, it was until all these researchers starting to get picked up by uh, private companies, uh, and that's where uh, there was more attention into, into, this, uh, into this field. Uh, and, and then, so first it was this MNIST data set to the characters, and then uh, uh, we started, uh, they started to apply it into harder problems like uh, image classification, object detection, uh, where no, there was no really good solution for it. No one could tell the difference between a cat and a dog. Uh, before uh, it was with convolutional neural networks because the problem is how do you describe this kind of a difference? Uh, in the classical approach, you have to describe all the steps of your algorithm to basically come up with a solution. But uh, I can challenge anyone to, to give me sort of some rules on where does a cat look different from a dog and you'll have a lot of trouble with that. So. By using convolutional networks, we don't have to have the domain knowledge. We just uh, feed the images. We feed in what is the actual label that we want it to produce, and uh, the network will learn by itself to produce the correct output. <coughs> so now, uh, this has been extended to uh, thousands of classics of objects. Um, that is in this uh, specific domains is actually performing even better than, than humans. Uh, in, in this uh, image classification, there was a, another project for, for example, for reading road signs uh, that are used by self-driving cars uh, that outperforms uh, the people's ability to read, uh, to read this road sign. So, uh, we're already starting to see uh, in specific domains these this networks uh, starting to basically beat human performance. Uh, <coughs> so just to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how these convolutional networks work. Uh, so the idea is, uh, is still this multi-layer um, idea, but what the convolutional networks do, they try to reuse a lot of these parameters. So the idea, the, the multi-layer perceptron, it just takes, uh, in, this, in this problem of image recognition, we would just take all the raw pixels and feed it, all of them to the next layer. Because the layers in between them, they're fully connected. So each unit in a previous layer sees all of the, all of the image. Uh, but the insight came from the, the uh, neocortex. So this model comes almost straight from biology books. 
where they did experiments with, uh, with cats, I think it was, where they would probe into the neocortex of the cat and then try to see what kind of neurons get uh, excited when you present different images to the cat. So uh, there's this known layered approach that the cortex has. It's not like fully layered, but you, you can kind of tell this layered uh, in the cortex. So they would see that in the lower layers, uh, they could find neurons that respond to lines, lines of different directions, for example, uh, different colors, so very simple patterns. If you probe a little bit higher, you'd see a bit more complicated patterns. So you could see simple shapes like squares, circles, and so on. Uh, if you probe a bit even higher, you see even more complicated. Uh, and if you probe on the top layer, you could recognize higher level objects. Uh, like for example, the, the famous Bill Clinton neuron. Uh, some researcher found this neuron that every time that person saw uh, a picture of Bill Clinton, this neuron will spike. So this neuron was the Bill Clinton, was named the Bill Clinton neuron, uh, which kind of is not really about Bill Clinton. It just shows that uh, in this high level in, uh, of cortex, you have neurons that respond to high level things like a human face. Uh, so this is the principle that is applied over here. The way we do it is uh, doing through this convolution. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the mathematical term convolution, it's basically a filtering operation. Uh, you have this small kernel. Uh, you, can, you can think of it as a, as a small window. And then you apply, you apply that same kernel on all positions of your image. And this uh, effectively generates a map. So we can treat uh, this kernel as a feature, and the process, the result of the convolution is the feature map, which tells you basically where is this feature in the image. And we, uh, so basically now we're reusing these weights. Uh, each of this layer now, they're not fully connected anymore. Uh, each of these layers uh, sees uh, basically each of these locations uh, is sharing the parameters. So with one, uh, with one uh, sample, we can get a lot more training out of that because it gets repeated throughout the whole images. And the same principle gets applied multiple times to multiple layers until you reach, uh, you reach uh, a small enough representation then you can use that to feed that straight up to a uh, multi-layer perceptron. So, it, well, sorry, it's getting trigger happy. So if you look there in, in the image, uh, all these all this maps is basically the convolutional layer. And at the end, the last part over there is the multi-layer perceptron that we had before. So what we did here is basically we replaced those handcrafted feature extractors with another neural network that does the feature extraction. And then we feed everything to the multilayer perceptron to produce the final outputs. Uh, so um, this was had tremendous uh, success, uh, but it was clear that sort of something was still missing, theoretically. Um, because if you try to solve more complicated problems, keep adding more layers, uh, the learning would not happen. So just like with the multilayer perceptrons, uh, this layering approach could not keep going forever. After a while, you couldn't learn. Now, it was not fully understood at that time, but <coughs> The problem was a fundamental one. Uh, it was a, f a fundamental problem with deep learning. So uh, as it turns out, uh, it, it was actually uh, sort of mathematically understood by, uh, by Sepp Hochreiter in the Swiss AI lab. Uh, out of that analysis, he came up with, with a mathematical understanding of this uh, deep learning problem which is basically the vanishing or exploding gradients. So the gradients are uh, these signals that are propagating backwards to the network. As I, as I said before, we feed, uh, we feed uh, 
an input to the network, uh, and this is the forward propagation path that produces the output, and then we take the output and the ideal output that we want to produce, uh, and then through this back propagation algorithm, we feed, uh, there's a signal that feeds backwards all the way to the input. The problem with this is that this gradient, so this signal that's going backwards to the system, is exponentially changing. So uh, if you know the nature of the exponential, depending on the base, if it's greater than one, it can explode to infinity. It can go to infinity. If it's smaller than one, it can go to zero. So uh, we're basically seeing the problem of exploding gradient and, and vanishing gradient. As you go deeper and deeper down the layers, this signal is changing exponentially. Now, the, the exploding gradient is perhaps not such a big problem because there's an easy solution to sort of cap it. So if it goes above a certain value, you just uh, cap it at that value, so you can quickly go around this problem. But the vanishing gradient problem was, uh, was a very severe one uh, because Basically, what I told you that if your, if your network was deep enough, this signal that is propagating backwards to the network that does the actual learning, that changes the parameters, it was never reaching all the way to the last layer. And the last layer is important because that is going to produce the, the initial features that you're going to need for all the layers on top. So eventually, if, if we keep adding layers like that, the, this training signal will never reach all the way to the end, so your last, the bottom layers will learn nothing at the end of the day. Uh, and out of this insight from, uh, from Hockrider's research, uh, they came up with uh, these long short-term memories, uh, we, we call them LSTMs for short, to basically get around this, um, this fundamental deep learning problem. And the LSTMs, they are uh, a recurrent neural network. So unlike uh, the convol convolutional neural networks, uh, there is feedback connections uh, through the network. Uh, so the problem now with feedback connections is that uh, you, you don't have this uh, beginning and end so you can go forward and backward through your network, everything sort of loops around, so you keep going forever. Uh, and the traditional way of training that is to unroll these feedback connections and basically uh, create a, a feed-forward neural network. So you can go forever, obviously, but you can unroll it enough for, uh, for the learning to happen. So depending on what you're learning, so for example, we use LSTMs at Sensible for uh, reading text and extracting, uh, extracting uh, information from text. So in the case of the text, uh, each sequence would be, say, one character or one word. Uh, so in order to learn, uh, to learn patterns in the text, you might have uh, thousands of characters uh, long patterns. Uh, and the problem is that if you try to unroll this uh, thousands of characters, you would basically have a thousand deep neural network. So that's why recurrent neural network networks were very, were not successful at all because uh, you needed to have these hundreds of layers of neurons in order to learn your problem. And because of the vanish ingredient problem, you are never to, you could only learn basically very short, very short time dependencies. <coughs> uh, so what they did is, uh, which is shown in that uh, very sort of messy diagram, uh, which is still a simplified version, uh, they added a state to the recurrent unit and they added these gates around it. Uh, so. This is why it's called a long short-term memory because so the output could be interpreted as the short-term memory and the internal state is the long-term memory that basically, uh, and you have these gates around it to protect the state from being changed. 
So this, uh, all these gates, they, they have learning units in there as well, and basically they learn, uh, so you have an, an input gate. So the input gate learns how to take the input uh, and incorporate it into the state. The output gate basically learns how to take the state and the current input and, uh, and produce the output. And, and a bit later on, there was this forget gate that was added where basically it learns when to forget the state. Uh, so this is useful, for example, when you're reading a pattern and you reach the end of the pattern, so you need to clear your state to get ready, so, so to speak, for the next pattern. Uh, so by adding these gates around it, uh, we are basically, <coughs> We are protecting the state uh, from being written to uh, at, at any time, which is the case of, of sort of the standard uh, recurrent nets. Uh, so now uh, the backward propagation signal gets preserved through the state across multiple sequences. So basically, this type of neural network has the potential, doesn't have a limitation on how far back it can remember. <coughs> because if a pattern is important enough, it can learn to know the beginning of the pattern, incorporate that into the state, and then uh, keep, keep basically reading the input until it sees some end pattern, and then incorporate that into the output. <coughs> uh, sorry, I need some water. Right, so um, long short term memory is basically our, our sort of slowly re replacing all these different uh, recurrent neural nets. <laughs> so for example, uh, Google replaced their, uh, like their, the networks that listen to you when you say, hey Google, all, all, the, all the sound detection, uh, they've been replacing them with LSTMs with uh, really great improvements. Uh, be, being able to slash their error rates by half. Uh, so to talk a little bit about uh, the deep learning that we do at Sensibil, so we use uh, this long short-term memories to read uh, the text on, on receipts that people submit to us, uh, and then we want to extract all the different informations from the receipt text. So for example, uh, what are the items that you bought? Uh, what's the grand total? How much taxes did you pay? Uh, and like 150 different things that we extract from receipt information. Uh, and what we do is we use a, a character-based uh, model. So instead of feeding words into, into our model, we feed each character at a time. <coughs> so uh, more, most classical techniques uh, work at a word level. Uh, so initially, you need to basically transform, uh, come up with a dictionary of words. And depending on what text it is, that can already be challenging. So for example, we're dealing with uh, receipts. There's uh, all kinds of things there that don't fit into sort of standard dictionary. There could be addresses. There could be all kinds of numbers. Uh, the text is imperfect. <coughs> so every word in the dictionary will have several versions with, uh, with slight mistakes in that. And, and the classical approach would be to uh, reduce all, all your words that you see in your data set, reduce them to a smaller set of dictionary. And then out of that, you you, you have a way to transform, uh, to map each word to a vector. And then you'd feed that vector to your recurrent neural net that does the recognition. So what we do with the LSTMs, we feed the input each character at a time. So now we don't have to worry about sort of the size of the dictionary, especially in our conditions. Uh, you don't need to do this lemmatization or stemming, which is our 
are, are some tricks that are used to, to kind of reduce your dictionary size. So for example, each word can be, uh, can be, um, it can be seen in multiple forms. It's sort of different endings. It could be the same root word, but it could be a name, an adverb, a verb, with slightly different variations. So one of the techniques is to try to reduce every word into its root form, uh, which involves a lot of pre-processing. Uh, usually all the numbers are sort of reduced to a single thing. So we treat all the numbers the same way. Uh, but especially in a receipt, numbers are very important. So uh, some numbers are prices, some they are like SKU numbers, uh, uh, street name, uh, street numbers, and so on. So we can not really treat all the numbers the same. Uh, by using a character level model, we kind of bypass the whole problem altogether. Uh, and uh, what we see, so this is uh, from, uh, from a paper where they basically try to map the character engrams of the words. So what we can see is that it's kind of learning uh, the basis of word formation. So here it kind of clustered all the suffixes together, all the prefixes together. So it's not just learning uh, to map words into vector, but it's also learning how word formation. So uh, by using this character level model, it can, uh, it can learn all the slight different variations and flavors of each word. Uh, and we don't have to worry about sort of um, correcting mistakes. So the network, if it sees sort of mistakes in the words, it can learn to sort of ignore the mistake just like a human would do, where you would read uh, 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 some text with, with errors in it, but you kind of bypass all the errors altogether. Uh, so, um, I think this is the end of my presentation. Uh, it kind of went a bit, a bit fast. <laughs> so, I guess I can reserve some time for questions. I know it's a bit uh, technical. Um, so I apologize for non-technical people, <laughs> and, and I'm hoping some of the technical people would, uh, would get some information out of that. Yes. Uh, we, we have a microphone, so I'll bring it around. Just wondering like, if you, during the training of a system, you kind of mislabeled, so you kind of say, uh, show the image of a, say, eight digits, but you said labeled is a seven. So late, so kind of the system becomes kind of polluted. Is it possible to detect, to retrain, to kind of, how is it resistant to such kind of errors? Yeah, so it's very dependent on your training set. If you have uh, what we usually call garbage in, garbage out. So uh, the thing is that this kind of architecture, they can learn anything. So for example, there were some experiments where they would take white noise images and they would label them. And the network will learn in the training set to just label correctly white noise. But if, you, if it sees a white noise image that it has never seen before, obviously it doesn't know what to do with it. So if there's inconsistencies in your training set, they're gonna get reflected into the, your output. So part of the challenge with this is basically how to, how to guarantee that your training set is good enough how to efficiently uh, label data and so on. <coughs> but the advantage is that, uh, so before with this sort of handcrafted designs, uh, if we see some new things that were never seen before, uh, you might need to redesign your system. It's gonna take sort of developers to code it, to think through, it's a long process of change. But with this idea is, if we see some new inputs that we've never seen before, we label them, we include them in the training set, and then we train the whole thing all together. So once you have it set up, uh, it's faster, faster development time. Okay. <coughs> Any more? So the question was if, you, if he can give examples of some uh, 
usage of sensible in this yeah so if you're if you're for example a client with scotia bank in your banking app uh, there's this tab called receipts and once you go into receipts uh, that's basically supported by sensible uh, which allows you to uh, take a, a picture of your receipt uh, and then the picture gets sent to our servers uh, then we read all the content, all the information that's in it, uh, and then we'll present that back to you in a digital form with, with higher level information. So this is basically our first product, uh, and obviously the like, second tier would be to, uh, to do something with all this high level data that uh, it's very valuable. So uh, currently we're just offering this service of basically being able to store your receipts and uh, digitize them and extract the high level information and offering back to you so you can sort of uh, track your spending, you can basically use those for your records, um, want to know how much you spend on coffee and so on, uh, uh, this kind of things. Okay, so we can take one more. Or two more. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have one question. At Sensible, do you do anything related to time uh, time series data analytics using incremental learning? Um, uh, I'm not. Like if you have like electronic transaction, not a receipt or something built, so I do. I want to do incremental learning on streaming data, like time series data online. Right. So. Uh, we don't do that currently, but these algorithms can apply the same way. So, in, in a way, we treat the whole text as a, time, as a time series, as a sequence of characters. Yeah. So, the algorithm doesn't really have uh, any, any information about receipts. It just learns everything from scratch. So, you can replace the text with any other time series, uh, and you'll be able to learn that in the same way. Yeah. And if you have some sort of mismatch between testing data and training data, do you do some sort of domain adaptation or you have to retrain the model? Uh, so usually, so if you have a model that's trained on different data sets, uh, usually if, if your data set is big enough, uh, it's better to train your whole model on the whole data set and then only train the last layer. So basically, all these features, so for example, for images, uh, what they call now, they call it transfer learning. So you first say, uh, learn your neural network on all your objects, to recognize all objects. Now if you want to train a model that just recognizes specific breeds of dogs, that is sort of very domain specific, you don't train the whole system, so you reuse the, the whole features that you learned through all, all objects, and you just train the last fully connected layer, that perceptron layer, to basically recognize between all the different types of dogs or all the different kinds of fruit and so on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So one more. <clears throat> so if uh, to your API, if I exp uh, instead of giving it a receipt, if I gave it a poster, uh, what will happen? A poster? Yeah, like uh, any random well, image which has text in it then what will happen? So uh, I guess so. we're only trained it in this context of receipts, so it's hard to predict how, how the networks are going to interpolate. If you have sort of receipt-looking things, it's probably going to pick them up. So if you have sort of numbers that look like prices, it might try to pick, the, pick those up. If you have sort of addresses looking like addresses, uh, but it's really hard to predict in sort of an uh, outside the box scenario of what the network is going to do. Okay, so because we have another speaker, we'll end up with the questions now. But uh, what if anybody has more to find out about Sensible? Where, where can they go? Uh, they can go to getsensible.com. There you go. Anyway, if, if you are on the, our meetup, we'll send the presentation and all the details about our speakers so you can contact them or their companies and maybe buy some products for them, from them. So, okay, th thank you very much, Julian. Oh, thanks. Yes, please, you're saying something. Oh, I was just saying currently we only deal with banks. 
but eventually we might open our API so you can start playing around with that. So if you want to work with Sensible, you have to open a bank. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you again. Okay, so our next speaker is Brad. Uh, okay, Brad, all yours. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dragos, for inviting me out to come speak today. Actually, it's the second time that I've spoken at AI Geeks, so thank you. Thank you, Julian, for that great introduction to deep learning. Um, for those of you who don't know, I've worked with Julian at Sensible, and this guy basically taught me everything I know about deep neural networks. So if you're really looking to dive in deep, he's definitely the guy to talk to. He knows the math right through to all the high-level knowledge. So he's just a tremendous person. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the Brad, I'm the founder of Electric Brain. Uh, I've been doing software for about 10 years. Um, if you count teenagers, and it's like more like 14 years, but those years don't count. Um, I've been doing AI more specifically basically since I got to Sensible. Uh, so I've been in AI for four years, and then more recently at Electric Brain, we've been doing AI services for over a year now. Um, so I'm just going to dive in deep and quick. Uh, so what is AI? What is machine learning? Uh, I like to say that AI, really what defines it is its emphasis on the data, that we have algorithms now where you can use the exact same algorithm, and if you get a, a very different data set, you get a very different result. Um, we've been doing this for years. Machine learning is nothing new. In, you know, it has. Um, you might say deep neural networks go back to the 60s, but it has its roots in stats. It has its roots in you know, the foundations of scientific knowledge and the math that we use to try and determine what, what is right and what is wrong. So um, I don't think it's everything new. So what is all this AI hype about? I like to say that the thing that defines AI and machine learning is trust. It's Although we've been doing and improving on machine learning algorithms for a long time, the big difference these days with AI is that we're willing to trust the machines enough to remove the humans out of the process. So the example I like to use here is that, you know, say you have uh, an AI system to help you hire people, you know. Um, in the past, you might have had, you know, you might have logged on to Bullhorn or some other, you know, staffing management system, and it would have told you, you know, connected you with potential candidates, and you would be like, oh, okay, I kind of like what this, it's suggesting with this candidate, I don't like this, and ultimately as an AR, HR person, you would just be taking the advice of the machine, and it would just be one data point in all of the data points that you're looking when evaluating a candidate. I like to say that the difference with AI today is we have those machine learning algorithms just the same, but now instead of having that person double check the machine, now we just let the machine take the, per take the choice. You know, when that AI tells you who is the best candidate to hire, instead of having an HR person clear that decision, the candidate is just hired, you know, and they just show up and you're like, wow, you know, you're the, you're the one the AI chose, welcome to the team, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's, it, it, AI is about trust, that's really kind of the distinguishing factor of, of thing. Um, always wanted to coin a phrase, so this is, this is what I believe. Um, I like to think about, <clears throat> I think about this idea all the time, some people call it the singularity, but I think before the singularity, long before any, or even if the singularity does doesn't happen, this is definitely still possible. It, there will be a time when mo almost every single business process in every single company is going to be automated uh, right through HR, um, you know, to the extent that HR even exists at that time, uh, right through to operations, finance, everything I believe is eventually going to be automated. And it's the people like me uh, who go around uh, with this strong belief that this can be done promoting this and telling everyone that your jobs are maybe in jeopardy. Um, as someday I think, uh, and maybe this is 100 or 200 years off, you know, companies as large as RBC and as small as mine will have basically the same number of human employees because everything else will be done by machines. So I'm just gonna jump into a little bit of history here, a little background, you know, automation, you know, automation is nothing new to the financial services industry. You know, it started like this, it started with 
um, oh, this isn't automation. So this is pre-automation. You had people, and they would literally just do the math, and they would calculate things, and you know, maintain these tape, these uh, you know, spreadsheets in paper and pen. Then we came up with like pre-calculated tables. You no longer had to do your annuity formulas yourself. You would just you know, get a sheet, look it up in a book. Well, here's, here's this value, then I multiply it in. Suddenly, that's saving me time. Then it moved even further. Now, this, this, my friends, is a very fine example of a mechanical calculator. This is one of the best. I've always wanted to uh, actually be able to hold one in person. They don't have it at the Computer History Museum, unfortunately. But um, uh, so mechanical calculation eventually trumped um, you know, mental calculation that made us more efficient. Uh, then there was the introduction of the mainframes. And so I like to, you know, financial institutions kind of get a bad rap nowadays for being uninnovative. And um, maybe they are, or maybe they're not. But certainly in these, this era, they were one of the first in our industry to really fully adopt computing. And maybe it's just because the ROI was there, just because there's so much computation, so much calculation that mainframes were worth it. Uh, but I think there's something uh, a little bit more fundamental to the nature of finance that makes it worthwhile. So I mean, after mainframes, then there was personal computation and the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, you were able to do, sp this is a very fine program. If you can ever get, like download a simulator, actually play with the original VisiCalc, it's, you know, it's a geek stream. It's uh, just an amazing revolutionary piece of program. No one actually bought this. Like they bought some Lotus notes, or uh, Lotus in general just took them out really quickly. Uh, VisiCalc never made any money. Famous story of those guys going broke. Um, but that turned into the spreadsheet that we all now know today. Um, we've been using spreadsheets, and we continue to use spreadsheets. I mean, I use spreadsheets, and I'm an AI guy, so I have lots of you know, my own financial projections. So spreadsheets, of course, they help automate a lot of the ad hoc sort of one-off calculations. And, um, you know, it continues. Uh, like, you know, the modern innovation now is big data, is Cloudera, is Tableau, is Hadoop, is Power BI. And these things are being adopted in droves, in my opinion, by, you know, not just financial institutions, but by industries wide. So what's all the hype? Financial world is, is no stranger to either big data or automation. I mean, big, big data has existed in finance since the beginning of uh, the entire financial industry. So you might ask, like, why is AI suddenly being talked about? Why is it, why has it suddenly become this, this, this big new phenomenon? And I would like to say, at least in my opinion, the, the big difference here is for a long time, Computers were really good at working with numbers. Like we were great at working with tables and financial analysis and risk and, and mortgage and modeling. Um, but now with the introduction of these AI algorithms, we finally have just as good algorithms, just as good techniques for working with text, for working with images, for working with audio, for working with video, for working with the full variety and types of data that we actually see in the real world. So whereas before, you know, you would be able to automate the mathematics that go behind, you know, the, the annuities on this, you know, complicated bond, um, now you can actually analyze the, the forms and the due diligence and the compliance that went behind that as well. So AI really, uh, I would say the distinguishing factor today is that we just suddenly have a lot more data that we can process using techniques that are somewhat well established. So I'm just going to jump in. I'm going to start talking about um, you know, some of the startups that we're seeing in the AI and fintech space. And really, I think it starts with the financial advisor. Uh, wealth management is massively profitable. Uh, if any of you have run your own wealth management, I haven't, but I've I know people who do. Um, these guys, you, you don't have to do a lot to, to make good money. And, um, Unfortunately, where there is uh, a lot of money, there is also an opportunity for disruption. And so we're seeing in the, the fintech AI space, uh, robo-advising is really kind of taking off. Um, and robo-advising can take on a whole bunch of different forms. And um, we see automation at the intake place, at client discovery, looking through not just learning about what the client wants, which, I mean, maybe you could survey them or interview them, but actually reviewing their existing finances. Like, rarely does a person 
come to you uh, with like a clean slate putting in their first dollar. Like they, they already own a house or they own, maybe they own multiple houses if they're really a wealth management client or you know, a boat and you know, they have a lot of assets that you're gonna need to dig into. But that client, just, that ultimately just comes down to a lot of documents and a lot of, uh, of things that can be processed. Um, you know, educating the client about finance. Um, chatbot technology uh, plays a big role here. You know, previously you would, you know, there was a lot you would have to teach uh, to your client in order to make, maybe make them believe you that you know what you're doing. But these days, that, could, that not only is that, you know, just putting content out available, which is not really AI, but with chatbots, you can really personalize that experience. The actual investment recommendations, of course, is is you know very easy to automate, and the portfolio management uh, we're seeing you know with high frequency trading and with um, you know end to end systems, you see a lot going on um, of innovation in uh, robot advisors. Uh, so I have actually come to believe more recently that almost all advisory jobs are in jeopardy. That everything you see here, accountants, tax advisors, uh, lawyers, insurance, all these professional jobs revolve around knowledge. And <clears throat> I would say with today's natural language processing ability, most of these jobs could be fully automated end to end. Um, is there a lot of companies actually automating this end to end? I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, I see uh, there are actually a bunch for each of these categories. If you want me to talk in detail, talk to me after. But um, uh, there's a lot of danger in a lot of the core business of what a financial institution and uh, even the small and medium sized financial players like these advisors, uh, they're all really in trouble. You know, accounting ultimately comes down to either working with documents or working with people to try and get documents that they're either withholding or they don't uh, haven't supplied to you. So you know, here's an example of some of the startups that are working in this space. We see Wealth Simple, great Toronto-based company here. Uh, Betterment, Motif, and Folio are some of the bigger American firms. Um, they, these guys will not have a person interact with you. Everything they do is technology based. They are technology based, they are really technology companies that offer uh, a financial institution services. So next, uh, next big area, customer service, very ripe for automation in, in customer, um, uh, in financial institutions. Uh, we've seen IVRs for a long time. Uh, you know, when you call up, um, basically any big of any of our big Canadian companies now and you talk to their customer service it it no longer asks you know please plus five for this I mean some people still do that but a lot of them ha ask you a question and just say would please state your problem I think that what we're going to see over the next little while is that IVRs go beyond routing you to some specific department and you know what specific customer service agent that you're going to be looking at we're going to see uh, with chatbot technology that you can really automate that process end to end. Like there really does not need to be a person on the phone anymore. You can, um, all of this can be automated. It's simply a matter of integrating that natural language processing capability with the you know, complicated backend infrastructure that actually connects. You know, <clears throat> someone once told me that an average call center agent interacts with 20 different backend software applications. And so the real hindrance is not the AI. The AI is definitely there. The thing that slows it down is just getting that AI integrated into the complexity of you know, the environment in a financial institution. Um, so here's some great companies that we see operating on automating customer service. Deep Pixel, wonderful Toronto-based company. If you guys are looking to use chatbot technology, I would encourage you to reach out to them. Digital Genius is another one of the ones that I kind of personally like. I've, I've, um, I find their approach, it may seem a little bit more complicated, but their approach is a lot more thorough and really able to handle the full variety of, of complex uh, call center type applications. So next, document processing, one of my favorites. Uh, so this is actually a classic sort of use case which is already sort of halfway through penetrating in a, a lot of different circumstances. You know, OCR and ICR have been around for a while and they really have not worked very well for a while. Um, you, we have been using these processes on mortgage applications, credit cards, checks, you know, receipts, uh, basically anything where you have that physical handwritten document. But for a long time, uh, ICR technology has really suffered on handwriting. So it works well when you kind of force the user to, you know, 
write one letter at a time and kind of break it up independently, but it really did not work well on really kind of free-flowing handwriting. But what we're seeing now is actually that the, com the technology is caught up to what you want, and where previously you might have had to keep a human in that loop where you want to double check that the machine actually correctly read the OCR, which kind of defeats the point of using OCR in the first place. But fortunately, a lot of companies have had to do this when they adopted uh, these technologies. I think moving forward, you're actually going to see that this can be done end to end, and that all of these paper documents, handwriting or not handwriting, will be able to be reliably processed. So here are some of the companies that work in this area. I'm sure some of you have heard of them. Um, at Sensibil, we used to use Abbey technology. Um, look into Captricity if you're really interested in the handwriting recognition. I think they've made really big waves. Their blog is, you know, some of the research that they've, that they've done on handwriting recognition, really, uh, really cutting edge stuff. Um, Here's us. Oh, this might want I really like this use case. So automating the insurance adjuster. Now I go, I pitch insurance companies probably once every two months, and I come with this use case usually. I come, I come to to propose to them this, and there are real companies that can automate this process. You know, used used to have you used to require a person to actually either come to the car accident or come physically to the vehicle to actually take a look. Is it actually broken? Is it actually damaged? Is it damaged in the way that they propose? You know, you don't want to be taken for a ride as an insurance company. You know, if you, if you just uh, eased up on those business processes, you know, the fraudsters would catch up just as quickly. But what we're finding now is that instead of having to use an insurance adjuster, uh, you can do this very reliably from photos. Um, local Toronto-based company Symbility is actually working on this exact use case. Um, you know, what you can do is you can, as I mean, if you can get out from the, like, you wouldn't get out from this car crash, but if it's a slightly more minor car crash, get out, open up your, your insurance app, snap photos of your vehicle, and that AI technology will be able to predict what are the damaged parts, um, how much damage, what is the likelihood of frame damage, which is not so easy to pick on the photos, and actually come up with a all nearly accurate, like to within two or three percent accurate uh, prediction on the repair costs of that vehicle. So really just amazing what, the, what we're able to do these days. And with those level of accuracies, you know, significantly fewer claims actually have to be routed to an adjuster. The adjuster is no longer necessary. And actually, um, I've seen there's one uh, Silicon Valley-based company called Lemonade, and they are essentially an insurance company, but their insurance is offered 100% through AI. And so if you use Lemonade Insurance and you get into a car crash, you do exactly what I just said. You get out to the extent that you can, open up your app, snap photos of your vehicle, it comes up with an estimate, you hit accept, claim is done. The money is already being deposited into your account within five minutes of you in that car crash. Um, so it's, it's really quite amazing what really, uh, what's capable. Another uh, use case that came, uh, came my way was using satellite imagery to try and predict uh, insurance damage. Um, what actually, in, in this particular case, uh, the individual I was working with was trying to get do lead generation for roof repair companies. But I actually think it's the, the technology that he developed is just as applicable for insurance claims as well. You know, if you're in hail, for example, in Alberta, um, you know, that can damage, uh, you know, produce significant damages. So, you know, here are some of the startups that are working in this area. Uh, as I mentioned, actually, Toronto Symbility is working on this, but they currently, to my understanding, don't offer this as a product yet. But, you know, Tractable, Cape, and, and Right In Them do offer this today if you want to try and automate insurance adjusting uh, within your technology. Uh, so maybe on to the, the darker side of artificial intelligence. So sometimes, you know, artificial intelligence can talk on, uh, uh, tip on some controversial activities, and it's not always necessarily automating um, uh, the things that everybody enjoys or likes. Um, we actually see AI technology in debt collection taking basically two different paths. There is one path, which is sort of like a predictive path, where they're using AI technology to help the professional debt collector 
decide what to do. Do I play hardball? Do I play softball? Do I visit their house? Or you, know, you could even imagine if you were a little bit more on the fringe, like, do I threaten their family or do I harass them or something? Like, all of those outputs, which you might think are crazy, are very much within uh, the, the guidelines of what you can do with predictive analytics. It's all about what do I say in order to get this person to pay their debts. Um, but there's another route that this is taking with one company, at least in, in the companies I'm going to show here, uh, where they're automating this end to end. Uh, they're automating the letters. They're automating the phone calls. They're automating uh, you know, subpoenas into court. They're automating procuring paralegals to fight that battle. Like they're li literally the entire process end to end of, of debt collection can't like, you know, I wouldn't work on every type of debt collection, you know, big complicated debts, obviously, you might want a professional debt collector, but, and you know, for parking tickets and you know, other things like that is definitely very possible. Uh, so that's collect AI right there. I would check them out if you're really interested in, in automating debt collection, eCollect and True Accord, uh, two other companies that are doing very interesting stuff in this area. Um, oh, one of my favorite use cases. So automating compliance. So I'm a big believer in the power of natural language processing. I really think that the technology is there today. And what we can do with AI technology is that we can review project plans, we can review user stories, requirements documents, and actually automatically determine those regulatory um, controls, those internal controls, maybe it's not always a regulation issue, those laws uh, that are relevant to that story. Uh, I actually, I literally did this project with a local company here uh, called Blueprint Software Systems. So if you're looking for technology uh, like this, get them on the phone because they're, they're building this out and they're gonna be launching this soon. Um, but I think it goes beyond just compliance review and just beyond the law. I really think that most forms of due diligence can be automated, whether that's reviewing a startup like mine in order, you know, checking our business plan and our finances in order to make sure that uh, we're kosher for an investment, you know, right through to looking at a new bond. If someone, you know, if Rogers puts out some new $100 million bond and they've collateralized it against some weird building, like you, you want to go in and check that document. You want to check, you know, is that building worth what they're saying is it, it's worth? You know, what, when was the last time that they had it appraised? Maybe they had it appraised like 10 years ago and they're using that that is their claim. So you know, all, there's a lot of questions that you're going to ask when you're doing due diligence um, that essentially comes down to emailing or calling someone to get some documents and then pouring through those documents for the supporting facts of your due diligence uh, checklist. Uh, so you know, and as well, auditing, um, auditing a public company's books, there's actually a, a, my my next slide is I'm not going to show this, but there's a company based in Ottawa called MindBridge AI where they've automated this process where they can show here's a transaction, here's all of the chain of supporting documentation for that transaction. The past emails that you had with that salesperson or that supplier, you know, here's where they offered you a discount that you never got, for example. Um, so MindBridge AI, um, I think for the most part, actually, I see this as an open opportunity. Haven't seen a whole lot of companies really attacking the due diligence problem besides MindBridge AI. So you know, check them out if you're really interested in this use case. So if you're looking for your next fintech startup, I would say that due diligence is a wide open avenue for for attack. Uh, so uh, this doesn't even count AI-based trading algorithms, which have, you know, I think taken a lot of the interest and in the, you know, the public imagination of AI and finance. Of course, are all forms of classic data science and predictive modeling, you know, churn modeling, risk modeling, uh, all of these things, instead of just using, you know, decision trees or linear regression, these things are just as well improved with the deep neural network techniques that Julian was earlier talking about. Uh, and also, you know, in functional departments as well, there's huge opportunities to apply AI technology beyond the core business in human resources when you're picking and sourcing candidates. Uh, in information technology and cybersecurity AI is actually detecting uh, intrusions and detecting um, uh, injection attempts on your APIs, you know, sales and marketing, writing the outbound sales messages. How do you personalize that message? How do you, um, how do you choose what to say in order to best convert that end customer? 
How, when do you offer coupons? You know, how do you prevent churn? Um, so AI technology also is lending a hand in all of these sort of classic, more traditional use cases of data science. So I, I didn't really get into these in any big detail because I don't like to say it. Um, AI is coming. You know, the AI dream is gonna take 40 years. It's, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take us a long time to really thoroughly penetrate our society with automation and elevate us all to the next level. But I don't think it's gonna be technology holding us back. When I work with the technology, for the most part, it's there today. It's the people that will be holding us back. It's the processes that'll be holding us back. And so if, you know, for those you know, companies willing to be on the leading edge, they will gain a massive of uh, competitive advantage in the marketplace. So it's, it's not the technology that holds us back, it's, it's really just the people and, and you know, whether people believe or don't believe in the technology. So a little bit of last, as my last slide here, shameless self-promotion, uh, Electric Brain, what we do is we build custom AI solutions using some in-house technology that we've created. And we typically focus on cost out projects where you essentially have your existing employees teach the AI how to do their job. Um, we find that these projects are usually the least risky and the, have the best business cases. So this is what we focused on. That's it. Any questions? Hi. Just wondering that we recently saw that fintech phenomena did not get that attention or progress that we were anticipating. Do you think that AI would also fit that uh, as well or not? Fizzle out? Well, all things have go through like a hype cycle. So I certainly believe that uh, AI is, is reaching the peak of its hype cycle. It's probably gonna peak mid to late next year, like October, like one year from now, literally, I think it's, that's gonna be the, the high point of the hype cycle in AI, and it's gonna die down, but then it's gonna pick back up again. That's how all of these technology trends go. Uh, you know, FinTech is, it was the same way, where, you know, peaked, all of the bad companies got sorted out, they all go bankrupt, and, you know, everybody kind of stops interest. But all of the ones who are good, who survived, they start to grow and take over the whole industry. So, you're right, it will fizzle out, but then it'll come back again bigger. Have you thought about an, an AI that would validate another AI? Because I think uh, whatever your outcome of your companies or other companies are coming up, up with AI solutions, there should be a way to validate <coughs> you know, all possible well, the ways of behavior of AI and also to figure out when it actually the AI will fail. So depending on what you mean by validation and, and what you're trying to validate, there are definitely solutions that exist today for accomplishing that. Um, we see in a lot of cases people are using AI technology to probe inwards on deep neural networks to try and understand what the heck it's doing. Uh, one of the most problem, biggest problems in AI right now, especially with deep learning, is that uh, you don't actually know why the network makes the decision that it makes. It's just kind of, you know, has its output and trying to understand it on a layer by layer level when you have like an image net now, uh, the best, the leading network is 152 layers. So trying to understand that depth is really quite difficult, but um, we see actually using neural networks where you can, um, uh, the mathematics here are a little bit, a little bit twisty, but essentially you train a second neural network to understand what that layer is doing and how it's contributing to the end result. Um, I think on the question of testing whether an AI is actually AI and not a human, I also know of there's technologies like people, like it's an extension essentially of reCAPTCHA. Um, but I know there's at least one company in Silicon Valley that's trying to work on, you might say, bot detection as, as a product. And that's, I think that's gonna be a very serious product. But on the, the flip side of bot detection, there's like, if it declares that something is a bot, it, it's very well decided between AI and, um, and human. So did that answer your question? Well, 
Oh, failure. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, this is something that I wouldn't suggest we're going to use another AI to try and find the failures in AI because that just that's error amplification. So, if you have one flaw in your validating AI, it's going to lead to amplification of errors in the AIs that it's trying to validate. Um, but I I would say that um, what what was I going to say? <laughs> I don't think I have a good answer to your question at this time, actually. Come talk to me afterwards. We go into it in more depth. Oh. OK, let's have uh, one more question. And uh, OK, uh, actually, this side, sorry. You, you, yeah. Uh, just wanted to know, like, the insurance claim, uh, FinTech that you showed, uh, especially the example of Lemonade, do you think that is going to sort of uh, encourage the development of adversarial examples uh, to beat the AI that Lemonade is using? Because now you're pretty much removing all the friction from the process, and it becomes lucrative for fraudsters to come in and generate adversarial examples to uh, make false claims. A hundred percent, absolutely, yeah. So uh, to his point, so there's, um, there are tricks that you can use with deep neural networks and image classification, which just blow my mind, where people, they take like an image of a kitten and they modify it just slightly and it's detected as a computer or as a desktop. They've essentially fooled the algorithm, but when you, the human, look at it, it still looks like a kitten. So very much, uh, we, we're almost certainly gonna see that in, in Lemonade AI insurance, but there's already a lot of research. Ian Goodfellow has put out a ton of research on this subject of how do you detect and guard against adversarial examples. Um, essentially what you can, what you do actually is you can come up with a ton of those. So for each image you have in your data set, come up with 10 adversarial examples. If you include those back in your data set, your network not only gets more accurate, it's like infinitely more resistant to adversarial examples. So I would say that um, tricks like that, for sure, that like, if you want to do some fraud, I would go do it right now because they're probably still prone to that. <laughs> but give it a few more years and I, I don't think it's gonna be an issue anymore. Okay, thank you very much, Brad. Thank you. Uh, if you want to contact to Brad, you have there the uh, website, but we'll, we'll send it also in the on the meetup. Now about our next meeting, uh, it will be on uh, November twenty second. So we'll have two guests again, uh, Tara and Amir. It will be at the City of Toronto, so City is uh, is offering us a room for this. So if you want, be sure to go on the meetup and uh, confirm your uh, presence there. Other AI events, especially in the near future. How to leverage AI intelligence in your business by Brad. Uh, Toronto Machine Learning Summit, November, Dave, I don't know, he was saying maybe he will come. He's not here, okay? So you can Google it. Applied AI Toronto, uh, run by Chinmay. Funny enough, it was exactly today. So we both of us planned it and we chose the same date, separate. So it's like a three events today. So there's a big competition out there. <laughs> so it's good that you came here. <laughs> Okay, again, a bit more about AI Geeks. Um, some projects that uh, we wanna work on. Uh, the first one will be Meditate with AI. Uh, we are starting with an iPhone app uh, to help you meditate. But then we maybe as a dream, we can have uh, different products that are using AI that can help you. Uh, maybe sleep better, maybe quit smoking, exercise better. Uh, Speak, speak better English, uh, that would be excellent for me. So um, you can join as a volunteer, donate a few times. Brad was the first one to uh, donate a uh, uh, bit of his time. Uh, so if you wanna work with Brad, you have to join uh, AI Geeks. <laughs> okay, so this is the layout for our uh, Meditate with AI. This is how I would design it. So if you know how to design it better, please, we beg you. Join us. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, this is uh, what you can get involved, work on a project of your choosing, you can suggest other projects and eventually if we have so many people that we don't know how, what to work on, uh, you can vote on the projects. We have a website, aigeeks.org, and the Facebook page and the LinkedIn page, so. Okay, thank you very much for joining, see you next time.